So I'm David Yulovich. Uh, I run a company called OpenDNS. We are based in San Francisco. Uh, we're somewhere between uh, a really small company and, and a small company, I guess, with about 150 people. Uh, in 2009, the company went from a very consumer-oriented company where we amassed 50 million daily active users uh, into an enterprise-focused company, realizing that we, uh, we had great security technology, uh, but that consumers don't generally like to pay for security. They all really want it. Uh, they don't really know what they want. They want security in general. Uh, it means a thousand things to a thousand people, but enterprises know what they want generally uh, and are happy to pay for it. And uh, so we made that change and we've been growing ever since. So I think I titled this talk, and I'm not going to try to be very salesy. I mean, also, I try to be a more efficient speaker uh, and, and try to do mostly demo. So hopefully uh, uh, we'll get to the demos and uh, we'll have some fun along the way. I also forgot my clicker, so it makes me feel very uncomfortable without the clicker. All right, so the security, the title, how, does, how are we going to deploy security for the way the world works today? And when we think about that question, part of what I want to talk about is how we see the landscape evolving. We sell to very small businesses, but also to some of the largest companies in the world, uh, including two or three now of the Fortune 20 uh, companies in the world. So we see a wide spectrum. And the way that we talk about the world changing is that there's a few major trends. The first, and this is not going to be a surprise to all of you, but I want to talk about what this means to you as a security professional as a security practitioner is the, uh, the rise of myriad devices, whether they're running iOS, Android, uh, Blackberry, even a little bit of Windows, uh, you're seeing the proliferation of devices regardless of who owns them. Uh, and what that usually means is that they're also being accessed wherever work needs to get done, which is happening outside your corporate perimeter. And when you think about the last 35 years of enterprise security best practices, it's generally been predicated on either having control of your endpoint or having control of the network and having visibility of traffic. Uh, and already with just two out of the three, I haven't even told you the third disruption yet, but even just with two out of the three, you generally don't have control of your endpoint, uh, or with you know MDM, you sort of have a little bit of control. But also, as people work from home and from Starbucks and from the airport, and when you have people out in the field and you have executives that don't want to use the VPN because YouTube slows down or whatever their whatever their complaint is, uh, they're not connecting to the VPN and you've lost network visibility. But then when you pair that with the third reason why uh, the world is changing from a security perspective and an IT landscape perspective, we really think about the fact that people are increasingly moving to the cloud, whether it's using Google apps for email, Salesforce for CRM, NetSuite for financial information, uh, the, the option E's for investor, uh, for, for private equity firms, uh, you know, obviously there's a ton of SaaS applications, Dropbox and Box just for storage. That transition is happening even across the largest uh, sectors we work with, whether it's Pfizer or the energy sector. Uh, even healthcare is starting to get access to SaaS applications. Uh, and so when you think about the common employee and the fact that people are now, you're chartered with protecting an organization, you're chartered with protecting them from systemic risk, right? You don't care about people being infected with PayPal mal you know, fishes or, or commodity malware. That's like an IT nuisance. It's like go re-image the machine. But how do, you, how do you deal with things that are really focused on your organization? When you have to deal with an IT landscape that's, that's pretty different, we think that it represents a new, sort of a new way of dealing with threats a new way of dealing with the loss of visibility. Uh, and at the same time, that, that most best practices, right? When we talk about best practices, I'm talking about you know, perimeter appliances. Uh, so whether it's intrusion detection systems or Palo Alto sort of behavioral analysis kind of devices. When you have employees that are out at Starbucks accessing Box in the cloud, none of those appliances are really going to do anything for you, uh, especially when the user is not going to VPN because they're using Google Apps. And why would you VPN and backhaul when you're going straight, straight to the cloud? So new IT landscape and the way we think about that, uh, and I think this probably resonates with most of you, and you can raise your hand and argue with me if you disagree, uh, is that security is unable today to, to keep up with the eroding network perimeter. Uh, Eton and I were just joking about how FireEye has like a $20 trillion valuation today, uh, because which is like you know infinity times next year's revenue, uh, because there is no security company. There is no security company. That's not a technical. That's not a specific number, by the way. Uh, <laughs> There is, there is, there is no, right? It's, but it is 10 billion. It is a 10 billion dollar company, and their revenues are nowhere near. You know, Checkpoint is also a 10 billion dollar company that does a billion dollar in sales every year. Uh, so, when you think about. Uh, 
companies like FireEye, the reason that they're being valued so highly is that I think most of us look at the, the security landscape and don't see people, the, the major incumbents, Symantec, McAfee, uh, uh, Sophos, Bluecoat, WebSense, is really filling in all the gaps in this sort of this new IT landscape that, that we live in, uh, which is why RSA was awesome this year. There's tons of new startups. It's a fun time to be building a security company. That's why I, I really like what I do. Um, and at the same time, the, the same time we're seeing the erosion of, of sort of security best practices, you know, I do think that uh, without being too sort of FUD, FUD driven, uh, we always try to sort of avoid that. Th you know, there are legitimate attacks now that are happening, that are happening on a much wider scale than we've ever seen. So things like the New York Times website being hijacked by the Syrian Electronic Army, and in, in an instant, the entire world being redirected to a new, uh, a new set of IP addresses. That happened back in August. You have things like CryptoLocker, which I think if the, the Ed Snowden NSA leaks hadn't happened, probably would have been one of the bigger stories in security uh, last year. Uh, a piece of, of ransomware that encrypts uh, people's files using public key crypto holds them for ransom. You have to pull out your credit card or, or pay in Bitcoin uh, to have your files decrypted. Uh, super, super sophisticated piece of malware that took the security community a long time to, to reverse engineer. Um, but really, uh, these, I mean, these guys are, are, are racking in millions of dollars. One of the versions of CryptoLocker has a 1-800 number that you can call for support. <laughs> And that's not support to uninstall, it's support on how to pay the ransom, just to be clear. <laughs> they really, uh, they really want to help you. Uh, it's, I mean, it's generous of them. There's, there's a, there's a, we called it, there's somebody that picks up and helps you pay the, the ransom. Uh, in fact, the only, thing, the only thing that's not smart about CryptoLocker, uh, which uh, one of the guys pointed out to me on our, on our finance team, was that you have the option of paying 300 US dollars or 300 euros, uh, and they haven't quite figured out that those aren't exactly the same thing. So. <laughs> If, you, if you're in a you know, foreign exchange hedging, you can just pay it in dollars and save yourself a few bucks. Uh, and then you have the rise of, of now, in, you know, sort of moving beyond the, the born identity, even Stuxnet, which was, you know, you think really doesn't affect my organization. Uh, for the first time, you're seeing uh, just prolific examples of nation state sponsored intelligence gathering uh, activities. So Red October, one of the first that, uh, you know, as, as conclusively as one can get uh, points to, to uh, uh, Russia as gathering data from, from different embassies across the world. We helped, we were instrumental, and we'll show you some of the demo of the ways that we did this. Uh, we were instrumental in uncovering the Red October attacks that had been running for over a year before anybody at any company uh, detected these, these uh, infections. They had been running silently on individual machines. They were super targeted at people that uh, had intellectual property on their laptops or had intelligence material on their laptops. Uh, so really, the, you know, we sort of have now evolved from the, the Tom Clancy and Jason Bourne uh, world of, of of, of politically motivated cybercrime uh, into real, real attacks. And then we talk about, well, whose job is it to fix it? Um, you can guess who I don't think whose job it is. Uh, it's probably not their job. Maybe you think it's their job. Uh, it's probably not their job. And even if it was their job, they may not be paying attention to your company or your organization. Certainly, they're, they're protecting some people. Uh, but I think it's your job. I think it's probably my job. Uh, and not to get too San Francisco hippie, I think it's probably, probably our job. Uh, and I think that what that means is that, uh, a little bit, a little bit uh, hippie. Um, I think what that means is that we talk to customers all the time, and in fact, the more upmarket we've moved talking to enterprises, we've found that our customers have become uh, Rapidly, either the companies are hiring more sophisticated uh, security practitioners who really know what they're looking for and, in fact, push us uh, to develop things that we don't have yet. Uh, we have customers that are developing their own solutions, writing code, hiring engineers in their in InfoSec group uh, to build better tools, better uh, uh, analysis tools, tools to connect data. They want to make sure that all the data they have from us is API driven so they can pull it into their own systems. Uh, so we're seeing sort of a, a general rising of the uh, raising of the bar. Uh, in terms of security, you know, sort of collective uh, capability and intelligence. Uh, and so we really spend a lot of time trying to figure out how do we help as a vendor, how do we help as a company uh, to raise the bar so that every industry, every company can uh, be able to practice security more effectively. Uh, I'm going to skip through most of this. At OpenES, our mission, uh, for those of you who have never heard, has anyone here not heard of OpenES before? You can raise your hand. It's okay, I won't be offended. <laughs> but every, is it only because you heard about it because David said it five seconds ago? Or had you heard about it before tonight? Okay, that's good. That makes me feel good. All right. You're one of our 50 million users, maybe? All right. 
Marketing's doing a good job. All right, well, they, all right, they can come back tomorrow. The, the paycheck continuation program will continue. Um, <laughs> So uh, just to give you a sense, one of the things I want to talk about is we have built a massive uh, uh, tool that we call Security Graph that connects all of the sort of different entities on the internet, IP addresses, domain names, uh, ISPs, BGP routes. We've built this massive uh, Hadoop cluster where we collect all this data. It goes back very far in time. I can type in any IP address and see what it looked like today, every domain name on the internet pointing to it. Uh, it's, it's a graph database. It's structured like it's not, it's not internally as a graph, but it's, it's it's exposed through an API as a graph database, which means I can say, show me every domain name that used a certain uh, IP address as a mail server destination, and what were all the MX records for it, that it and as, show it to me as it looked like on the internet three weeks ago, uh, which is pretty powerful. And part of the reason we're able to do that uh, is that we have 50 million daily active users. That would make us twice the size of, uh, of Comcast or just slightly larger than a Comcast Time Warner. Uh, it means that we handle uh, over 50 billion DNS requests a day. We see uh, uh, essentially the entire knowable DNS. Uh, and we've now augmented that with about another 50 billion additional data points coming from other sources, domain registrations, BGP feeds, uh, flapping on the internet, uh, who is information. Uh, what web server software things are running. So if we see a bunch of web servers all being compromised and we realize they're all running the same version of WordPress, our system can all of a sudden taint every other IP address in the world running that same version of WordPress. So we have some very cool techniques that we've built in, uh, in our back end. Uh, and then obviously we're, we're a customer-driven organization. So some people take us seriously. They run our net, their traffic through us, uh, which we take, uh, we take that responsibility greatly. And the reason that we focused on building this data is that, uh, and the reason that I think as a, whether you work with us, or there's a bunch of other companies now that are sort of doing some of this work. Uh, one of the things that we, we want to make sure people understand, and this is what, what Eton is focused on as well. I mean, he showed you run hash, which nobody else in this room has, uh, which was cool, it, which is that as soon as a piece of malware is out on the wire, uh, it's generally so polymorphic uh, that, that this idea that you can react to security and be reactive and after the fact, uh, the signature is already useless. You can't push out a signature up Date, uh, at that point it will be too late. You have to be doing, you have to be doing on the wire anomaly detection uh, or you have to be taking other approaches. Uh, and the approach that we talk about uh, at OpenES is that we think that there's a, a better way. Let's see what my slides say. Oh yeah, metadata, a word that you're not allowed to use anymore. Uh, in fact, you're, not, you're really not allowed to use it at all, um, <laughs> which is bulk metadata collection. So uh, that's actually, you know, the, while in the media I think that word has been tainted, I think in this room uh, we can safely use that and understand that if you have context and situational awareness of what is every domain name on the internet currently pointing to, uh, or for instance in the case of the New York Times, what percentage of traffic for the New York Times comes from North America, and who's the ISP hosting it, and can you still start to can you start to build patterns that say, well, we know that their ISP gets a certain percentage of traffic from North America, and that way, in, in an instant, when the New York Times is now hosted in Eastern Europe, and they're on an ISP that never gets traffic from North America, uh, on an I, on an ASN that has upstreams that never get traffic from North America, maybe you can have anomaly detection engines and classifiers and all these things that can look at all those little bits of metadata and come up very quickly with a little bit of a red flag and say, hey, wait, maybe 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 this isn't right. Maybe Maybe this high volume site that gets traffic from North America all of a sudden is pointing to an IP address that two weeks ago was being used as a phishing site and this week is now getting traffic from North America from a site that uh, never makes changes. That, that, that might be something you want to prevent from happening. You want to be proactive and you want to be predictive there and not wait till after the fact. So, We've built this system. Uh, we, we generally don't share it in, in even uh, as large of audiences as this. I think that in the private sector, there's probably no system quite, uh, quite like it in the world. Uh, and we'll demo it in just a, a minute here. So to give you a sense of the scale that we're operating at, I think, the, I think you'll be able to see this pretty, pretty easily. Uh, we're collecting this from a global vantage point. It's not just enterprise customers. It's not just consumers. Uh, we have a geographically, demographically, topographically diverse set of traffic sources we collect. About half of it is our own traffic base. About half of it now is data that we're acquiring from other sources, uh, some public and some private. Uh, to give you a sense of the kind of uh, neat information that we're able to sometimes see, uh, you can imagine that bad guys need to register domain names for their command and control infrastructure, uh, and they're going to use a fraudulent credit card for that. Well, there are certain domain registers out on the internet uh, that after five days when the credit card 
comes back as being reported as fraudulent, we'll revoke the domain. So we get a feed of all the domains that are registered and then revoked within five days due to a fraudulent credit card. And we can start to build models and figure out who are the bad guys based on what registrars are using, what domains are being revoked within five days, and then start to look at all the other domains that were using those name servers and start to really build complex models that go above and beyond just looking at internet telemetry and starting to move into other areas of telemetry to really augment and, and assist our ability to build these models. Oh yeah, I didn't make this slide. This slide's good. So. Uh, uh, this sort of reiterates the point that I was making previously, which is that we have all this data that some of it's owned and operated, some of it's proprietary. Uh, but then our security research team uh, is a bunch of data scientists and graph theory PhDs, and they've built a bunch of tools, which I'm going to show you, uh, I think, right now. Oh, yeah. Uh, the last slide before I go into the demo. A lot of people try to understand what does it really mean to do predictive threat intelligence? What is it, when you hear, if, if, how many of you were at RSA this week, last week? Oh, only a few of you. I guess maybe it was too cold to fly out. I don't know. <laughs> but we have to do RSA New York soon. So at RSA, there were a ton of companies that all talk about doing threat intelligence. I'm sure you get all these emails in your inbox. Uh, the way we look at it is we look at even people like FireEye uh, as companies where you get shot with a bullet. And then they say, hey, wait a minute, you got shot with a bullet, let's go examine that bullet. <laughs> or it's like, you got shot with a bullet, let's decide whether or not that's a good bullet or a bad bullet, and they run it in a sandbox and other stuff happens. Um, in all these situations, you've already been shot with a bullet, uh, and I, I've never been shot with a bullet, but I, I don't think it's probably, uh, this probably does not feel very good. Uh, and so we try to take a different approach, and the best analogy we've been able to come up with is that we really liken it to more like a satellite overview. And if you can see troops forming on a border, if you about the way modern military uh, intelligence and warfare works, you really want to get situational awareness ahead of time. You want to see troops forming on the border, and then you want to choose how you want to respond more, more uh, appropriately. So troops forming on the border in Chiapas may be dealt with differently than troops forming on the border of Syria, and you want to know these things before a single shot is ever fired. And these tools are available, not just from OpenDNS, right? There's other companies that are, that are focused on this space. So to give you a sense of this, and then I'll, I'll jump in the demo. So everyone knows the New York Times got hijacked by the Syrian Electronic Army. It was on August, I don't know, 27th. Uh, they convinced the registrar to change the DNS records. The entire world got rerouted. Um, and I think we were the only security company in the world that was able to detect that and prevent it. And the way that we did this is that at every instant on the internet, we're constantly building these models and these graphs of all the name servers that domains are using, all the other bits of metadata, how much traffic they get from North America, who's their ISP, what other domains are hosted by that ISP. Uh, and these are the kind of techniques that, that companies are using now to really change that, that reactive approach and to try to be much more proactive and, and predictive. And so uh, and so our system you know, is able to classify all the different entities. Uh, and then it knows that at, at time zero, and I know this is a little bit difficult to see, uh, at time zero, all of a sudden, our classifiers are running, and other companies that do similar things are running. And they detect that all of a sudden, four sites that were previously discrete and unrelated are now all pointing to one IP address, and that's a red flag. And so there, there's classifiers and anomalies that you can build. And you can do these things on your own network. Oh yeah, that's much better. Thanks. Uh, they don't need to see me, it's okay. Uh, the, uh, the other things you can see is that it's pointing to an IP address that we know is in Eastern Europe and has never gotten any traffic from North America uh, in any significant volume, uh, and that's a big red flag. Reasons You're able to make ahead of time, without ever visiting the site, without ever waiting for a piece of malware to be injected into your network, without ever waiting for a piece of binary uh, code to be placed onto your network, you can make the decision and say, look, I don't want to egress or ingress any traffic from that source on the internet. It's just going to be a black hole to me. Uh, and so we think that's really powerful technology. We think that when people, part of the goal of this talk is so that, you know, as the discussion around things like bulk metadata uh, collection evolves, we think it's really good to be transparent and open about how it's happening and, and how companies can use it for, for extraordinarily good things uh, and for you to understand the sort of the power and potential of how it can really uh, assist you, not just uh, inside your own network uh, by doing anomaly detection, but even by taking a, a macro view of the whole internet. Any questions so far? And then I'll, I'll jump into a demo. All right. Oh, yeah, and then we, we fixed it, and the CTO of the New York Times was, was happy with us. And tr he used Twitter, which is like the social networking thing where people talk about nothing. Uh, and, and he said that if you want to get to the New York Times, you can use OpenDNS, because no other ISP around the world was able to get to the New York Times. We ended up blocking it and then, and then manually fixing it. Uh, oh, I'll, I'll go through one more example, and then I'll, then I'll go into it. So I talked about CryptoLocker. The thing about CryptoLocker is that 
for months and months and months, the security community was unable to reverse engineer the domain generation algorithm, right? So you had this obfuscated code, and inside the code of CryptoLocker, every day it would phone home to a new command and control uh, and a new drop site to get, to get instructions and download the private keys to encrypt your files. And for months, people weren't able to, to reverse engineer that. Most security companies you know, have these malware analysts and these, these guys who live in, in IDA and, and in assembly, uh, and they were unable to figure out where it would phone home tomorrow or the day after that. Uh, and even if you have a FireEye appliance, it, you could run it inside of a sandbox, and all that it would tell you is that you had CryptoLocker, and that they knew where it was going to phone home to today, but they had no idea what domain it would phone home to in an hour, or the next day, or the day after that. So when you have a tremendous amount of data, one of the things that you're capable of doing is looking at patterns and building automatic pattern generation systems. So, so one of the researchers on our team looked at the last 30 days worth of domains that came, came out of CryptoLocker and said, can I build, I don't know the algorithm inside of CryptoLocker, it's obfuscated, can't figure it out, we don't have the right kind of people on the team to reverse engineer it, can we instead build a sister algorithm that's going to basically take the same inputs, knows that, that uh, the output has to look like these 30 domains that was used previously, and can it predict what domains might be used in the future? And so it looked at everything from string length, to what domain registrars are being used, how long ago were the domains registered, and they started to build a model and uh, the tools available to do this now uh, are, are quite sophisticated. And so we published for the security community a list of 500 domains that we believed were very likely targets in the near future for CryptoLocker. Uh, and we were fortunate that we were able to be right every single day. So we feel like this is, this is tremendous power that uh, the security community has unlocked. We've published this research uh, publicly. Other folks have now, have now figured out how to do this with CryptoLocker. Uh, about two or three months later, uh, the, the, the domain generation algorithm for CryptoLocker for CryptoLocker was, was reverse engineered, but it's always nice to have a two or three month head start. And again, this had nothing to do with having to reverse engineer malware. This was all done by looking at other data without ever analyzing the malware itself. It's pretty, to me, it's pretty incredible stuff. All right, let me go into the demo, because I think that makes people more excited. We wanted to show customers and, and, and people in the research community, we've made, I'll sit down so you don't have to keep moving the screen. Uh, one of the things we wanted to do was prove to people that we built this graph database uh, and that we see a whole bunch of information uh, and, that, and that it moves very quickly. So uh, we now have the capability, we built a GUI for it. Everything in the API, uh, is a, everything in the GUI is driven by the API. There's actually much more power available in the API. Uh, but we made the GUI to show off parts of it. So this is an active command and control, prestounial.com. Uh, it has still not been taken, taken down. So we've published a bunch of the classifiers that we're running. And uh, one of the things that we think is pretty, pretty cool is you can type in any domain, any IP address, and we, we cross-link this stuff, I'll show you in a second. Uh, and we run a bunch of the classifiers against it. So the first thing is, uh, do people here know what fast flux means? Is that a term? So fast flux means, uh, and, and I already heard two people say no, so that was, that was enough. So fast flux means that if you have a domain name and you change the IP address it's pointing to, like whack-a-mole, multiple times throughout the day, and you do that to evade takedowns. Uh, and in fact, the, the attackers have often automated this process. They'll compromise 100 or 1,000 machines, and then the, the botnet itself is sophisticated enough to just keep moving the, the command and control server amongst those compromised machines. And they do this so that you can't just call up some ISP and say, hey, you have, a, you have a, a command and control server, if you go take it down, the botnet's killed. They try to play this whack-a-mole game where they constantly move around. In fact, they're so sophisticated now where some of the botnets uh, are, are actually not just fluxing the IP address they point to, but even the name servers that they use are also fluxing around. So having a name server that was just registered and that was never used for any good legitimate domains is a big red flag on the internet. Uh, you should, most name servers are generally used for good stuff, and bad name servers are used for bad stuff, and there's not a whole lot of cross-pollination as a, as, a, as a technique for detecting uh, bad domains. Especially if the domain was, uh, the name server was just registered in the last, you know, five days or less. Uh, a suspicious prefix for, score, again, relates to this, this fluxing where generally websites are hosted uh, in, in the same ISP. Even if you move the IP address, you usually don't change ISPs. Um, and in fact, even if you move your website, let's say the New York Times wanted to go find a new ISP, 
That doesn't mean you should automatically bl block it if you're doing anomaly detection, uh, but generally you're not going to move your website across continents. That's a thing that you don't have happen. And if it happens 20 times in one day, that's a big red flag, right? <laughs> there's, no, there's no legitimate websites that are moving 20 times across you know, six different continents. Uh, I don't think there's any websites in, in Antarctica. Uh, across six different continents uh, in a single day. So all kinds of patterns in, in behavioral analysis that you're able to do uh, just based on traffic. Uh, oh, this is kind of cool. So the botnet was dormant. This, I didn't know this until I just pulled it up. The botnet was almost totally dormant and then uh, it spiked uh, today. So let's, let's take a look at what it did. So the first is that we can see every ISP that's currently hosting this botnet. Uh, it's currently hosted across 270 different, and ASN is, is kind of synonymous with an ISP. Um, if, if it, it's more of a, it's, it's a term used in the, in the routing world. Um, but it, it's almost synonymous with an ISP. Sometimes it'll have one internet provider will have multiple ASPs sense, but not usually. But then where it gets really cool is we can also, we look at the geo distance, so we calculate as it's hopping around, what are the total number of miles it's traveled in a certain period of time. So you would definitely have, you know, United 1K status uh, and then some uh, if, you were, if you were flying this. Lifetime member. Lifetime, yeah, yeah. You would be global services for sure, uh, which is, you know, the dream that every person has uh, that, that is ever on the road. So, uh, or, or just my personal dream. So, uh, just, oh, uh, this is 225, so it hasn't, it hasn't updated. Oh, it'll update for, for tomorrow's traffic. But if you look at, at 225 when it was really being hosted, oh, I know what's happening. It's getting traffic, but it's not hosted anywhere. So since the 25th, it actually hasn't been hosted anywhere. The botnet's been, been down, but there's still infected clients phoning home to it. Uh, and I, I can't explain the, the spike uh, today, but I'd have to look into that. But up until the 25th, it was live and active. Uh, and these are just in one day, all the different IPs it was pointing to. And what's cool is that you can now build a map and say, for everything else pointing to this IP address, here's a whole bunch of other domains that we've detected as being malicious that are also pointed there. And if somebody goes and registers a domain name tomorrow and points it to that IP address, it's likely going to be tainted, right? It doesn't automatically mean it's bad, but it's probably tainted. And we can see if there's other domains that are pointed there. So there's a whole bunch of other domains. I'm going to go through here fast because there's usually inappropriate domains um, that I don't want to put on the screen. But we haven't decided that all of these are bad, just a subset of them are bad. So just pointing to the IP address alone doesn't automatically make it bad, uh, but, but it, is a, it is an indicator that the ISP may not be very responsive to abuse, uh, the server operator may not care, and as a, as a practitioner, it's really cool to be able to have these tools. The other kind of thing that's neat is if you're doing incident response, uh, let's say that you have Splunk or you have ArcSight and you have a thousand, you have a million logs uh, a day coming in, one of the things our customers often find is that they really lack that sort of satellite overview. They lack that, oh, sorry, they lack that situational awareness so that when they see a firewall entry pointing to a certain IP address, one of the things that they're not aware of is, am I the only person on the internet phoning home to that IP address? Or am I one of 50,000 people phoning home to that IP address? And so we're able to answer those questions so that you're able to detect, is this a sophisticated and maybe targeted attack where I am the only victim and I'm phoning home to an IP address that uh, you know one of my other event management system, you know, my event management system or one of my other firewalling systems uh, or maybe my, my Active Directory uh, firewall, uh, my, da my DAF is able to, thinks it's suspicious. If that's the case, what else does the rest of the internet know about that IP address? So having that situational awareness is really important when you're doing incident response uh, and so that's why we, ma we make the GUI uh, available. Uh, but it answers questions that are generally not, not known to other people. Also, we've discovered that uh, in talking with, with people that uh, most logging software and tools out there don't actually give the domain names, they just give an IP address. So this is, this is one of the many ways. There's a few other tools out there. There's the passive DNS tools uh, from ISC that also help you figure out what's the domain name I might be uh, egressing or exfiltrating data out to. Question. Yeah. Um, what kind of an interfaces are you exposing to, to Third-party vendors that want to use information. Yeah, so so to customers, everything. Generally, not client source IP addresses. So when we say bulk metadata, it's generally on the authoritative side of it, not on the on the client recursive side. We just use the clients to help do geographic query counts and volumes of traffic. Um, to partners, it, it depends, but we do expose it to some partners. Sometimes, sometimes just for free if we think that they're really uh, in, in adjacent spaces. Uh, so we have a partnership with FireEye right now that's, that's pretty incredible, where we take their deep dive behavioral analysis and then and, and then marry that together with our, our sort 
sort of situational awareness uh, and predictive intelligence. Um, and I think, with, like with your stuff, we could we could do something kind of cool. We will. Oh, that's the confidence. All right, I like it. Um, yeah, so the, I mean, and then everything's available in whatever whatever API format people want. So w one of the things we've noticed is that security organizations are becoming increasingly sophisticated in writing, like I said, writing their own code. Uh, so really, I think one of the things that people should be looking for from vendors going forward is that every vendor should basically be uh, exposing your own data and your own results to, to you in particular. So that would be cool if people have things they want to type in, your own company. Uh, maybe sometimes people are afraid of that. Um, you know, you can always type in things like chevron.com. They're not in here. They're not in the room. Uh, and we can look at all kinds of data. So that would be cool if people want to play around with this. We can, we can uh, try to either stump the security graph or find out if people in this room have uh, infections on their network. So an another, this is probably gonna, this is going to break my machine because Cloudflare hosts a lot of, of malicious sites. But um, the other thing is you can type in an AS, and we'll just show you in the last week all the uh, suspicious sites that we're detecting just in the last week uh, across an, an entire ISP. Um, I have another question. Yeah, sure. Can, can I understand um, how the score works? For example, if, if I got a score, can I understand what are, are the, 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 the contributing factors? Yeah. yeah. So, so the question was, when, when we give a score of negative 100 to 100, uh, can you find out how we came up with that answer? Uh, in, in, in the API, it's available. You can actually get every single classifier scoring, uh, and you can figure out how we decided something was bad or good. Um, the other cool thing that you can't do in the, in the GUI, and this now is, feels more salesy, uh, is you can go back in time. This is all real time, but in the, in the API, you can say, I want to know what it was like a week ago, uh, which is, again, for instant responders, is, is pretty powerful. We don't think there's tools out there in the market quite quite like this for instant response. How far back in time do you go? So it depends on what you're accessing. The question is how far back in time can you go? It depends on what you're accessing. So domain to IP address mappings go back in, in the order now of years. If you want to know traffic volumes and some of the sort of uh, high velocity, high volume data query counts. That goes back about 120 days. Um, we're generally in the business of storing things as long as possible. And uh, so I would expect that most of our data retention is, is, is going back as far as possible. We do eventually uh, aggregate client query counts and things just so we don't have that data available. But uh, everything else we try to, everything that we, we think is non-PII, our goal is to keep it forever. Yeah. Are you or have you built models of who you can see appears to be behind some of some of this continuous activity? So maybe looking at the way they name domains, the time of day, or something like that. Yeah. So the, 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 that sort of falls in the, the question is: Have we been able to sort of do the uh, attacker sort of attribution or identification? We we bucket that. That's that's a, the 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 most fun part of security, and also often the most difficult uh, part of security, which is we've started now trying to bucket. Uh, so with Red October, for instance, which was the, this this uh, this this sort of class of multiple attacks that came out of Russia, we had been blocking it for almost a year, but we never knew that it was state sponsored. We actually never really knew what it was. We just knew that anyone sending traffic to those domains probably shouldn't be, and we were blocking it. So we've become very good at the algorithmic detection, and we're, I would say we're still pretty naive, and I would say the industry in general is pretty naive uh, in, in its ability to actually identify attackers. Um, we worked really closely with Kaspersky on Red October. They, they were the ones who figured out that it was state-sponsored. Uh, they were the ones that really did the, the, and they have a much larger research team than, than we have. Um, there are some companies out there, uh, CrowdStrike, uh, is one of them trying to do sort of attacker attribution. And it's much easier to pool attacks into one group of attackers. It's much more difficult to then identify who that attacker is. Um, I, I'm, I'm still generally skeptical of people that claim to be able to do that. Uh, I think on individual cases it's possible. As a product, I think it's difficult. difficult. Yeah? Oh. Well, they got DDoS, so I, I don't think it'll be that interesting. So I mean, so DDoS is is a type of attack, but not generally one that uh, I mean. You can see their query volumes went up a little bit, but not not substantially. Um, let's see if they change their IP addresses. So let's see if this updates. So now they're using Cloudflare. Let's see when did they start using Cloudflare. 
So on uh, all the way back until February 27th, they were hosted at the same place on Cogent. Uh, and all the other domains, they were virtually hosted. Oh, and you can see all their meetup domains. So that's pretty funny. Um, Hongkong.meetup.com, horses.meetup.com. So if you're interested in horses, you could, you could, you could go there. Uh, I'm going to stop looking at these because I'm sure that I'll find one that I don't want to say out loud. Uh, <laughs> horses and Hong Kong, or, you know, I don't, I don't know. Uh, it's, you know, the internet's got something for everybody. So, uh, that's what makes it incredible. Uh, so anyway, but yeah, so you see, what's kind of cool is you can see that they made the switch, they started getting DDoS, you know, uh, you know, about a week ago, and then they, they switched over to Cloudflare, uh, and then my guess is that Cloudflare took control, yeah, and started doing the, the remediation uh, over, the, over the ensuing days. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, you can also see that uh, we do a few other things that generally work much better for malicious domains than good ones. So with good domains, you'll see all the different uh, JavaScript they have on their page. So whether it's like Google Analytics, so we call that co-occurrence. So things that they're embedding on their pages. Um, so if I type in, uh, I don't know, opends.com, you'll probably see things like Google Analytics show up as a co-occurrence. Uh, well, we're a bad example, I guess, because we do weird things. Oh, we embed our own domain name on other pages, that's why. Um, but on malicious domains, co-occurrence is a, is a cool technique that, again, you can only do with bulk collection of, of, of traffic information, which is that if you're infected with a piece of malware, we'll look at everyone else on the internet who's infected with that same piece of malware uh, and phoning home to the same domain name and see what did they look up 10, sec 10 seconds prior, 30 seconds prior, five minutes prior, and see if there's other domains that may be sort of redirection engines back to the original command and control. And that's one of the techniques that you can only do if you're looking at tremendous aggregate, aggregate amounts of traffic. Uh, so things that are very cool. In fact, I think with, with the Presto Unial site, uh, that, uh, that is possible. And if there, does anyone want to type in a domain, try to stump it? Sometimes it gets stumped. We, gener we think we generally know about everything, but not, not always. Oh yeah, so. Uh, a lot of people that load up uh, Presto Unial previously went to gateway.pace.com. Uh, so that either can identify a organization that was targeted in an attack, uh, which is kind of neat, uh, or things that for some reason, and we can look into one of our classifiers and see why we thought they were related. So in this case, maybe there's nothing, and people just phoned home to Windows Update and uh, the Adobe Update servers. Anyone want to anyone type in their own organization? Go to unisys.com. Like this? Yep. Uh, so we think it's benign. We think that your ISP is not the best ISP. So who's your ISP? Oh, it's yourself. And let's see, why do we? <laughs> let's see if we can figure out why. So we'd have to. So the API is better for some of this stuff. Logging domains like WordPress or something. Does, it, does that show up as all the subdomains on WordPress? Yeah, it will. Um, so that, one of the nice things about blocking things with DNS and not IP addresses is that you don't have to block entire domains. Um, and if you have a proxy, you can do things by URL. So if you click on in one of the IP addresses, so they're hosting it themselves. Uh, I think we have to pick a, a, not their main domain. Does someone know a good WordPress subdomain? Nobody uses WordPress? Uh, I don't know if any of these count. We, you have to find a, uh, like someone who has a blog on WordPress. All of these are owned by them, so they're not the same IP addresses. Try Brian Krebs. Oh uh, yeah, Krebs on security. Mm. An incredible site, always. Uh, so Benign gets decent traffic, hosted by Prolexic, not surprising. He probably gets DDoS on a rate. He probably doesn't even get DDoSed because he's always being DDoSed that it doesn't it doesn't really <laughs> doesn't really get noticed. Um, so if you want to see how, how Prolexic it works, um, and yeah, so this is where you'll see people that send traffic to him. So people that have RSS feeds, Ars Technica, ZDNet, Wikipedia, Sophos, New York Times. This this starts to make more sense uh, for him. And then if you want to see his IP address. This is probably an IP address that, that Prolexic assigned him. They're only using it for him. Um, if you want to see what the next IP address down is, you can find out another one of their customers maybe. It's always a nice way to walk, 
So safe, safestbillingpage.com is also a Prolexit customer. Uh, it's a nice way to walk, walk customer lists uh, if you're a DDoS provider. <laughs> <laughs> Cool, so these, these tools, are, we generally make these available to researchers. Uh, if you are uh, an incident response person, uh, we, we, we obviously we sell this as a tool. Um, if you work at a security company, we sometimes make it available. So if you work at Symantec, probably, probably not. Um, if, if you, if you uh, are Eton, maybe. Um, any other questions about, I mean one of the things I really wanted to convey in this presentation is that uh, as people sort of talk about bulk metadata collection, uh, I think it's a topic that's important to people, for people to talk about openly. I think that you know, the, the PR response from uh, the Snowden revelations have sort of tainted the conversation. Uh, we, so uh, any questions on, on the power of you know, big data, security analytics, and the, the tools you can use? Yeah. Has anyone asked you to, to not collect it on their domains or, uh, or groups of IPs or not to map them because they're... So I think from the... So the question is, anybody asks us to like opt out of collection? Um, we allow customers that are running their traffic through our network to disable it, to, to turn off logging, um, both to turn off logging, but also to, uh, you can turn off reporting and you can even turn off our, our backend logging. Um, so that's available to people that are using, that are running their traffic through our network. So for those who don't know, we also run a network where we, we apply enforcement. So we did all this security research so we could actually block stuff for people. Um, We've never had anybody ask us, probably because we're not on people's radar enough. Uh, so I think as more people recognize some of these tools we've built. Oh, is there a, the pager? Someone's car is being towed, maybe? Uh, oh, it is? Yeah, oh, it doesn't matter. Maybe he'll stop. He'll stop in a minute. Okay. So um, we've never had a website ask us to. I don't think we would, as a general. And this is on the internet. But it's public. Yeah. I mean, it's it's sort of this is stuff on the internet. We think that when customers are going through our network and their and their source IP address and other stuff is there, they have a right to opt out of it. I think you know us being able to see what our what what people on the internet are doing is is acceptable. Well, do you think you, you think that you you surface some stealth networks. Uh, I'm not, I'm not saying yeah. disclose anything like that. No, we know we have. I mean, certainly on attacker infrastructure, we see that bad guys are reusing infrastructure. We see that there's ISPs that are totally non-responsive. Uh, I mean, the spammers 10 years ago were doing a pretty good job of outing non-responsive ISPs. I mean, we see that there's just ISPs that just get used over and over and over again. Uh, and they're legitimate ISPs, and maybe they're just you know understaffed. Uh, so we don't we don't go out of our way to out them like we don't have a report of the worst the worst offending ISPs that I think we probably won't do because it it's like a spam house or something. yeah we're not trying to shine the light this is really used as an enforcement tool for our customers and as a as a incident response tool so that if you're a security practitioner and you want to be able to say hey look I have a log line here of me phoning home to some IP address and on my network I want to know am I the only person on the internet phoning home here what else is talking to it what was it last week what was it the week before? I think that I mean those are powerful incident response tools, and, and I, I believe they deserve to exist. Right.